What is up, Pathfinders, and welcome to the Parallel Paths podcast. My name is Artemis, and today we are going to be looking at the chapters three and four of the Redacted series written by Chanel Trejo and Matthias. Once again, a disclaimer, this is only formatted if you have read those chapters. If you have not, this is not going to make any sense. So go ahead and hit pause, come back to the video when you have read the chapters and uh, join in the discussion in the comments below. And thank you for being a part of the Parallel Paths Book Club. reading we are going through the redacted chapters three and four today chapter three is called the redacted it is on starts on page 34 if you want to go there so we start off at blue base in the break area at 9 06 a.m and they're still kind of reeling from the stuff that well they're first meeting with jasper shaw um, our group is basically dissecting on what just happened, whether they're going to be helping Jasper Shaw or not. They decide that they are going to go to the redacted and that, that they are going to, they're going to go ahead and try to investigate this Jasper Shaw, not, not to just help them, but to understand who who they're dealing with and what they're dealing with um so on page 38 they go to the unit at 9:10 so the previous conversation only took 4 minutes and for them to walk over so i guess it took 2 minutes that's a little odd i like to keep track of the times because i think that is going to be important later on Jasper doesn't even notice that Bailey is missing. We do know that when when Samantha asks Jasper whether he has any type of enemies who would like to do him harm, he brings up the name Magnolia Ward, which is a name that we know because the doors. It was written on one of the doors that was right next to Deb's name. So this Magnolia Ward is somebody that has worked for Jasper Shaw. Jasper says that Magnolia took Deb's death pretty hard and skipped out on them as soon as she reported it. So Magnolia was the first one in their group to find out that Deb was dead. So what does that mean? Was Magnolia spying on our group? Or did Magnolia know where Deb was the entire time? We don't know. We That remains to be seen or spoken about or whatever. And if she did know where Deb's whereabouts were, that would mean that Deb trusted this person highly because not just anyone knew where Deb's hideout was or where she was. Um, so this Magnolia person would have known Deb very, very intimately to know where she, her hideout was. They do a couple of questioning and then Jasper ha asks Matthias to stay behind. I wouldn't want to be left alone with this guy. I don't know about you, but I would not want to be left alone with Jasper. He is very creepy um, and everyone gets a bad feeling around him. Nobody thinks that this guy is friendly, despite his trying to appear that he's on their side. But Matthias does stay behind 
And Jasper asks about Matthias's dreams, whether he's still dreaming about Syntec and that he was very close. Not only was Nelson Cyphus in Matthias's mind, but it could have worked both ways. Matthias could have been in Nelson's mind. And that uh, Matthias is going to be more important than what he thinks he is because of this. And because of these, this like intimate relationship that him and Nelson had, Jasper basically clues him in that they're going to be coming after him. So it was right after Jasper's warning that Matthias gets this vision where he's looking through Nelson's eyes and he sees Deb and Jasper talking about a patient. And then basically Matt books it out of there. Uh, next, we see that we're back at Blue Base in the lobby. And Bailey, Sam, and Woods want to know what happened because Matt just took off. And it's interesting, like, point of view that we get. Matthias says everything's fine. And then we get in his head. It's not fine. <laughs> it's interesting that we get these thoughts and these feelings consistently from Matthias. And I did highlight later on a thought that Matthias has that kind of had me like, what was that about? But we'll get into that later. But it's nice to see his point of view, not only his point of view, but his thoughts and feelings as well. Well, back at Blue Base, they basically go over the evidence that they have so far, which is the questioning of Jasper Shaw and Magnolia, this Magnolia Award. Matthias sends an email to John Doe asking if he knows anything about the organization The Redacted. And if he knows anything of the name Magnolia Ward. And it's interesting, in this chapter, they don't refer to him as John Doe until the very end of the chapter, but they refer to him as Jim Colt. So maybe we should refer to him as Jim Colt. I don't know. He's always a John Doe to me, though. I kind of like... Yeah, Jim Colt is a cool name, Christy, but I don't know. I He's John Doe in my head. But Jim Colt is definitely a... Uh, cop name. Here's the thought I highlighted from Matthias. Woods said, I still don't trust him. Woods confirmed with a solid nod of his head. Even if he was Deb's assistant and she trusted him, people can go bad when power the power goes to their head. And then Matthias has this thought, you would know all about that, wouldn't you? about people can go bad when power goes to their head. What does that mean? You would all, you would know all about that, wouldn't you? And he says, I had to shoo that thought away, rubbing my chin as I thought of the next response for the AI. When did Matthias, did Matthias ever go bad because of power? Or is this... It almost seems like he's like talking to, it's like Matthias's conscience talking to Nelson. Like you would know all about that, Nelson, wouldn't you? But he doesn't say that. He says you would know all about that, wouldn't you? It's just an interesting thought that he had that I caught and it really doesn't make sense. If you guys have any ideas and if you're listening on the replay crew and you guys have any ideas let me know what what that could be referring to because it's like I had to stop reading and think about that like why would he think that I don't know they get an email from an zero overlooked zero at gmail.com and if you remember, Overlooked was the magazine that Jordan Kendall ran. And I think we found that. We found the clippings of that inside of Wes's bloody lab coat. And he was buried with it. 
So, chapter four, a snappy new ally. That kind of gives you a clue of who they're going to be talking to, a snappy new ally. I like that, Chanel. That's a good... Chanel or Matthias, I don't know who wrote who whose idea was that the chapter, but a snappy new ally is definitely a good clue as to who we're going to meet at the library. But we take it takes place at the Santa Clarita Library at 1228 p.m. Bailey Woods and Matthias that is at the library and Samantha stay behind to look at the time machine. Jordan, Jordan Kendall, that worked with Deb. And now we know that Jordan Kendall is working with John Doe. But here is a little if thought for you. If Deb put the group, the redacted, together to fight Sentec, why would she need Project 863? And why would she need John Doe and Jordan Kendall? If you make a group to fight another group, wouldn't you put all your resources into that group? Why does she have Jordan Kendall and John Doe working outside of the redacted and not like with Project 863 and with like why would you why would you have these people working outside of the group that you worked for if you did not fully trust that group? Christy says maybe to get more inside scoop from Syntec. Maybe she was hesitant. T says maybe she was hesitant and didn't know if she could trust the redacted. That's what my thoughts are. She didn't even trust the redacted to be working there. She decided to create a hideout to work there. And we know she didn't fully work there. She did have an office there, but we also know she had an office built underneath the stairs. So n not only does she keep resources from the redacted, but she also doesn't fully trust them to be working next to them. Because why would you need a second office if you already had an office if you just didn't want people to know? Overkill. Uh, says perhaps Deb had a reason to believe that that the redacted wouldn't be enough or she got the idea that someone in the redacted was a snake in the grass. I like that. And I think the person that we think is a snake in the grass is Mr. Jasper, right? <laughs> in fact, I highlighted something about Jasper Shaw. On page 59... Jordan, Jordan talks about how it was like to work with Deb and Jasper. Something a little off about him. Like we, he was always trying to prove something to Deb, including trying to push me out just to get her attention like a child. I don't think it's attention like a child. It sounds like a narcissist. Um, if you are in a relationship, especially with, with a narcissist, they try to isolate you from people. They want you solely dependent on them. And Jasper Shaw, I mean, it's not a leap to say that Jasper Shaw is a narcissist. Um, our team's fully picked it up already, you know, to push Jordan Kendall away from Deb seems like he was trying to isolate her but also fighting for her attention like a child also gives us a characteristic of of Jasper Shaw that he would do anything to please Deb and if we go back to the vision that Matthias had in Jasper Shaw's office it was a vision of Nelson Cyphus talking with Deb and Jasper. And for a narcissist to be talking with a CEO like Nelson Cyphus, if he's doing whatever he can to get the 
attention of Deb. He's also going to do whatever he can to especially get Nelson Cyphus's attention. So somebody like that who is trying to get power to be top dog is going to snuggle up to the person with the power. My theory, and I have not read past the book from Pat, chapter three. Chapter three is where I stopped reading the book because then I loaned my book to a foster kid. So I have not read any of this book, but I believe we're going to find that Jasper Shaw was not only fighting for Deb's attention, but we're going to find that Jasper Shaw was fighting for Nelson's attention. And I think we get that in the evidence that Jordan Kendall brings us. I'm not going to go too much into Jordan Kendall's conversation. That I'm going to leave for reading. You guys should have done your reading. But Jordan Kendall comes across as very pleasant, very direct, and very honest to Matthias. And when Matthias seems to kind of question her, she doesn't scoff at it. Like, she understands why our group has to be protective. And she doesn't get her defenses up when our group is hesitant to believe everything that she does. Um, and she seems very open and honest. She gives them files to keep not only to loan, like every single time that we've gotten evidence from somebody, it was always with strings attached, even with John Doe. For us to get like the um, antidote for Matthias back in season two, I believe, two or three. Uh, John Doe was like, oh, but you have, to, I think it was three. It was season three. John Doe was all like, oh, but you have to solve this for me. Or you have to do this for me. Season two. Christy says. But it always came with strings attached. And Jordan just gives them what she has. Because she was solely there for Deb. And Deb's vision to take down Syntec. And even Jordan says that she wasn't fond of people in Syntec. She knew what was going on. She was writing an expose on it. So Jordan's vision is going to be very aligned with Deb's. Um, and so the fact that Deb created 863 and trusts 863 and it was her favorite special project, Jordan is more than willing to help them out and be bend over backwards to help them out. And she just seems the whole... Meeting with her just seems very pleasant and almost like very refreshing because it's like, it's almost like meeting Scott. Scott was the same way. He was very open. He was very um, helpful and it, very helpful in taking down Autumn and to get them answers, especially from D3B. He knew how to work D3B and get answers that they needed so Jordan Kendall, in my opinion, is right up there with Scott as somebody who is, who's trustworthy, I think. And it almost seems like after the meeting with Jordan, she, Matthias agrees that she, she's somebody to be trusted. We do get another thought in Matthias's head that they ask, you trust us that easily? She nodded, an eyebrow quirked. I mean, yeah, why wouldn't I? You guys are her project. I can trust you most of all. And Matthias has a thought in his head and says, I wonder if she would have said that when Nelson was wandering inside your head. That trust is certainly conditional. The little voice reminded me sharply. I don't like this voice inside of Matthias' head. I don't know if it's Matthias's doubt but, you know, back to, you know, the other thought in his head, it's very, you know, you would know all about that, wouldn't you? 
about power going to the head. And then we have him saying that, you know, she wouldn't trust you if Nelson was, you know, worming it inside your head. That trust is certainly conditional. I don't know. I just don't like this thought inside of Matthias's head at all. Bailey asked her, was there someone else at the redacted that you were suspic suspicious of right off, just right off the bat? And Jordan answers, honestly, I'm probably the last person to ask. People in the redacted are misfits. A lot of them are dealing with trauma from their time at Syntec, while others are dealing with their guilt for what they did at Syntec. So that basically implies that the people in Redacted are not only the people that worked at Syntec, but the pers the people that were also subjects and being worked on in Syntec. Because who wants to take down Syntec more than the people that were ex experimented on and tortured there? So we get that little insight of what the redacted supposed to be or is trying to be. Um, but after the meeting with Jordan, it they go through the files, uh, page 322. Let me flip back over there. Uh, we get a Syntec profile summary of Xander Price, which was the person who was in the video with Scott Clark, sorry, Clark, um, Scott Clark in the laboratory where they were talking about Chloe. We get a Syntec profile of Jasper Shaw. We get a Syntec profile summary of Magnolia Ward. And we also get notes from that uh, Jordan took of a meeting of a patient progress notes. Um, Deborah, Nelson, Cyphus, Jasper Shaw, and Jordan Kendall are participating in its concerns of patients 2126. Wyatt, Tal Talia, April, Chloe, Deborah, Wesley, Gary, Scott, Jordan, Benjamin, Daniela, Autumn, Carly, Mariah, Levi, Bryce, Heather, Cole, Isabella, Xander. Those are the Syntec profile summaries that we have already, along with Pete. One, two, three, three people that are already redacted. Chloe is 5'4", 198 pounds. She's 29 years old. She has red hair, brown eyes. When did they start at Syntec is redacted. The official title is redacted. The additional information that we have on her Syntec profile summary is trial patient for Project Spire. And that is all we get on Chloe. And I do not see any patient number pertaining to 2126. I have the transcripts of the Apple II the text chats. I also have the transcripts between John Doe, all the John Doe and Jim Colt transcripts. I have all the transcripts of Benjamin Colt, the patient F chat. I don't see anything 2126. I had the transcripts of all <laughs> Deb's phone calls, the John Doe phone calls. And Scott. I don't see anything on patient 2126, but I do have the transcript in front of me of, of Xander Price, where he's talking to Scott, so I can read that to see if there's any clues. Xander says, so what are you going to do, just refuse to work with her? Scott, no, I'm going to speak to Wes about it again. He's going to want to know... 
what she's doing. So you, you said Wes was the only person who can convince Deb to change uh, her mind about anything. Xander, are you are you going on about the 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 human the the trial experiments again? Like, where do you think we work, Scott? It's not like that, okay? I'm I'm sorry, but her projects are supposed to be different. She's always told me that. She told, she's always told Wes that, and it feels like she's lying. Xander, okay, well, Nelson's been pulling a lot of pressure on her. You know that. Scott, no, she's always been strong enough to stand up to Nelson, especially when it comes to patience or when things get going, get, when things get going too far. Xander, like like you have, look, this is a lot for you, especially for someone like you. You probably see more than any of us. So talk to Autumn. She's been with Nelson for a while. She might be able to help you. Scott, no, I I don't want help learning how to cope with this anymore. Xander, okay, then quit. Scott, Wes needs me. Xander, did you talk to him about this? Scott. Yeah, uh, yes, he, he, he's worried about, about how she's going to react. Xander, Deb, you mean? Scott, Deb, of course, Deb, but I don't even care anymore. Xander, it's just a patient. Dozens of patients come through our door every month. What makes this one so different? Scott, I've had... I've never had my name on a project before, and now I do, and I have this, this responsibility, it's heavy. Xander, and I told you, you'll get used to it. Scott, I'm not going to get used to the, the screaming and the crying and the way their mental state, it, it just breaks. Xander, yes, yes, you'll learn to block it out. Look, the work we are doing here can save millions of lives. And I get it, human experimentation, it's horrific. It's terrible and it requires a lot of sacrifice. But it's necessary. And you'll get used to it. Scott, I, I don't know, I, 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 this is the first test that I've sat in on. And I, and I don't see myself ever getting used to it. She's so young. Xander, the patient. What even is her ID number? Scott, Chloe, her name is Chloe. Xander, so you're naming the lab rats. Scott, don't. Xander, no. Scott, don't. Xander, please look. Please look, it's just one patient. Buddy, you have a lot of people here gunning for your job. You are close to Wes and you're close to Deb. You're... Close to every higher up in this company. They can push you forward. It's not worth it to throw it away over one patient. Scott. It's funny. Wes said the exact same thing. And that is the end of the video of Scott and Xander. So apparently we had two Xanders that work for Syntec. And that was Xander Price. That's harsh. Yeah, it is harsh. That's why I think um I think it was Samantha was really pushing that this this patient 2126 is probably Chloe. And in the in the um meeting for the patient progress that uh Deb suggests removing Patient 2126, who has become mute from the trial program. Nelson refuses to move her. Jasper suggests periodic visits from an on-site psychologist. So it kind of seems like Jasper Shaw is kind of on Nelson's side of this. But it's interesting, if this is Chloe that we're talking about, Scott was worried to talk to Deb about removing her from the trials. 
And we know that Deb wanted, if this is Chloe, and this is talking about Chloe, that Deb wanted to remove Chloe from the trials. But both, but Nelson refused to. And Jasper kind of seems like a middleman, but siding with Nelson about everything. But this, again, doesn't help with the murder that they're supposed to be solving. They're supposed to be solving Jasper Shaw's identical twin murder. But information is information. They decide that they're going to go back to the redacted to find out if they have more information but they're going to do that tomorrow and that leads us into chapter 5 so interesting things interesting things but nothing helps them really get closer to Jasper's murder unless we think patient 2126 is the murderer in my opinion who cares <laughs> who cares that this guy gets murdered <laughs> I'm sorry it's bad I know I know I know what were you guys' thoughts? What were you guys' opinions on these chapters? I think they're very well written. There's a, a, a lot of behind the scenes things that are happening. Like the people turning their head. We also get somebody is watching them in the redacted. So we do have more key players, I guess, that are going to be coming up. Um, because right now they're sticking to the shadows. But let me know what you guys think. I don't trust the redacted, just the fact that Deb had to have a office outside of the redacted. She had to have a hideout outside the redacted. Um, and she had informants that were outside of the redacted. So I don't really, I don't really trust. I think it's going good so far, Christy says. I think it, I think it's going really good. Overkill. Wait, uh, T says, I don't trust the redacted, but I do trust Jordan. I agree, T. Overkill says, I don't trust the redacted so far, and especially not Jasper. He gives me the creeps. I don't want to write off the redacted. I think that there could be potential informants there. And I'm kind of on the mindset of uh, whoever kills Jasper. I don't. Are they really a bad guy? <laughs> Murder is wrong, I know. Murder is wrong. But <laughs> are they really a bad guy? I don't know. So I'm excited to read chapters um, uh, five and six. So that is our homework until next Saturday. And if you are listening to YouTube Monday, uh, readings oh, we're reading chapters five... I mean, uh, chapters five and six, and you should be ending on page 115. Thank you for listening to this segment of our book club of reading The Redacted. If you have made it this far in the video, please remember to like, subscribe, hit that bell icon to be notified when we post every Monday for the next chapters. Be sure to check out our website. Link is in the description below. And there you will be connected to all of our social medias. And also take a look at our merch and see what we have for your platform. And with that, we will see you guys next week. Bye.